This is Watkins. Welcome with Bridget Fetisy. I'm Bridget Fetisy, and you are welcome. <laughs> <laughs> You know the drill. Please subscribe, rate, comment, share, reach out, tell your friends, send smoke signals, whatever. We love your feedback and we want to hear from you. This week, we'd like to thank our sponsors, Calm and Beta Brand. Calm is the number one app for sleep, relaxation, and meditation. For listeners of the show, Calm is offering a special limited time promotion of 40% off a Calm premium subscription at calm.com slash walkin. That's C-A-L-M dot C-O-M slash walk in. Getting ready for work and deciding if today is a stylish day or a comfortable day. Now, thanks to Beta Brand's dress pant yoga pants, you don't have to decide. Right now, our listeners can get 20% off their first order when you go to betabrand.com slash walk in. Since his liberation from concentration camps, Jacob Bressler immigrated to the United States, served in the U.S. Army, became an American citizen, studied opera in Vienna, produced for Austrian television, owned and operated several businesses, including numerous restaurants, and has traveled the world sharing his remarkable story. Jacob wrote a book, You Shall Not Be Called Jacob Anymore, an autobiography of a child of the Holocaust. And we sat down and had an amazing conversation and now he's my best friend and we <laughs> we meet for coffee all the time and I'm I'm humbled and grateful to be able to hear his story and share it with you. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much for the for the accolades of course. <laughs> Which is very unusual. Very unusual. Yeah. So we're practically know. neighbors, you know. So. Know. <laughs> Separated by one block, actually. I know, it's bananas. Yes. So we were talking before we started recording, and you were, just, you were telling me about an experience you had speaking in Germany, and that you didn't know all the questions. Yes, and he was a Swede, by the way. Yeah. The son of a diplomat. Okay. And he, he challenged me. Because, first of all, I said, look, first of all, I am not an Israeli, and I am not a Palestinian, but I know something about it. But if you want to know, why don't you educate yourself? The question was, why am I, are we treating the Palestinians so bad? I said to them, first of all, I am not an Israeli, that you accuse me. I'm an American, so don't accuse me of, of anything of that sort, because I have nothing to do with it. But I mellowed him, and uh, I told him to go and read history. Then we can talk about it, because there is nothing worse than talking out of ignorance. Yes. Do you feel like there's, do you follow politics? You Very much so. I'm a, I'm a junkie. Are you? <laughs> Political are you, junkie. Are you on <laughs> no, I, I don't use any of the of the uh, social medias. Because you're a, a exactly, you're exactly, a exactly. And, uh, you know, I listen to five different stations in five different languages because that's my mantra. You know, I am a historian, not only a historian, but I'm not, I couldn't call myself a historian. I've lived a long time, of course. Right. But I like to listen of different opinions. Right. Because if you listen to the American media, I don't get anywhere. I don't get anywhere because football and uh, baseball is more important than anything else in the world. And I'm of a different makeup. Yes. <laughs> I'm, I'm totally different. First of all, I speak five languages. And uh, luckily, I, can, I am able to tell the differences. Right. And we are so different. We are alike, but yet we are so different. And uh, that helps me, of course. Uh, I mean, it helps me personally. <laughs> it doesn't help the overall situation in the world, but it helps me as a person to appreciate 
what is really going on? Because if you listen to one station, you you are not uh, you're not you get no knowledge really. Yes, yeah, and we are, we are, absolutely. Look, I tell you, I, I have a lot to, to do with young people because I lecture very often at UCLA. Okay. And uh, sometimes I'm amazed. I'm amazed at the ignorance mm -hmm. of our youth. Mm -hmm. And I'm also surprised at some, how much they do know. Right. So it's a contrast, you know. That I cannot possibly make out how to how do they manage that? <laughs> you know, because it takes a mastery to really do it. Right. What do you think is the, the solution to? We have so much knowledge, and yet it's still the <laughs> you put it very mildly. It's all right. <laughs> yes, but uh, I personally believe communication, communication, mm -hmm. communication. Yes. Because people go through the, their lives not knowing. Mm -hmm. Not that they are too stupid to know, but they just don't care. Right. And I believe that we are put in this world to love each other. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult for me to describe this because I am a, a humanist. Mm -hmm. I know no borders. Mm -hmm. I know no religions, no creeds, no race. To me, you're a human being. Mm -hmm. And as such, I treat you like that. Yes. And my family is doing the same thing, thank God. Yes. But, uh, but some people, just don't disregard knowledge. Mm. They listen in one direction for someone who, oh, I've read it on, on the internet. Oh, it doesn't mean anything. Mm. It means nothing. Mm. Actually, today especially, the way we know that is being abused, our social services are being abused. Mm. So I do not use any social services at all. Nothing. I don't know any Twitter. I don't know any uh, Facebook or whatever. I. It's not me. It's not me. I. I like to be on one-on-one -on -one yeah. because I see where this leads to. You know, I. I worked in television. Uh, I have. I've worked in films. I've done so many things in my life, and I have noticed that whatever you, as a person, project to your next fellow human being, that is more than anything else. On a one-to-one -one basis. If you, you know, there's an old saying, in Hebrew we say that, um, Maimonides said that if you save one life, it's like I've saved the whole world. Right. And I believe in that. Mm -hmm. I get so emotional. Of course. It's, 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 Oh, I do too. I get very emotional because maybe it's my background. It must be. Yeah. I come from a family that uh, we were brought up with ethics. Mm -hmm. And uh, I carry on. I'm the only one who does. And to me, this means everything in my life. Mm -hmm. And I hope to continue as long as I live, as long as I can. And I do in my own small way. I uh, try to do my best. I don't hate. I love people per se. Mm -hmm. Only the people that do not adhere to my beliefs. I don't hate them. I just disregard them. Right. The word hate is an oxymoron, actually. You know, mm -hmm. uh, We all say, oh, we hate, we hate. We don't really hate. Mm -hmm. We dislike. There's a difference. There's a great difference in that. And uh, I try to abide by the rules the way I was brought up. Mm -hmm. And there were very ethical rules and beautiful rules. And as long as I don't hurt anybody, I am uh, good to everybody. I have no enemies. Mm -hmm. Never had. 
I should retract that, actually. <laughs> it, I did have enemies, when the, because I was born a Jew, and uh, there were forces in Europe at the time when I was born that were not very conducive to my health mm -hmm. or to my being. <laughs> not conducive to your health. <laughs> I have to be. I have to be gentle. Right. I shouldn't be gentle, but I have to be because, as I said before, I am. I don't hate. I don't hate. Mm -hmm. You know, when I lectured in Germany, and I lectured every every year, the first thing I said to me, they asked me, the first thing is, Mr. Bressler, how do you manage your hate? So, and there were children, really 18 year olds, and they were very, very nice, very nice people. I said, first of all, let me say one thing. I do not hate you because I have no reason to hate you. Right. I, you are post war children. You were born and you're not responsible for the actions of your parents right. or grandparents or uncles. Or in, so, let's settle this. To me, you are a human being on my level. You might not have gone through what I have gone through, mm -hmm. but to me, you are human beings. Mm -hmm. And I hope that you will learn something that I correspond to you. Mm -hmm. And we always got along very well. Okay. I got letters from them that I can't begin to tell you. Praising my uh, attitude. and uh, There is no praise. I don't deserve any praise. This is my natural being. Mm -hmm. That's the way I was born. You said something interesting in your book that struck struck me, and I think it was right when you were talking about your brothers, how he... He gave up. He gave up. No. And, and you know, the question that you, you ask a lot over and over in the book is, why me? Yes. Do you have an answer to that question, or have you come to one? I tell you, if I want to be philosophical about it, I can say it was meant for me to be. Why I was meant to be here, I could not possibly tell you. <laughs> this is something that is very abstract, you know, yeah, very, very abstract. Why, why anyone? Exactly. I mean, why eight members of my family? Yeah. But I am happy that I was chosen to be left. Mm -hmm. That's the only thing I can say, chosen. By what, by whom, I don't know. No. no, that's why I survived. And that's part of my question is, part of it is just luck, right? Or just sheer whatever. Sheer luck is right. And Plus, part of it is health conditions that some, maybe you didn't get sick and someone else did. No, I tell you something. I, you know, I, I, I don't praise myself because this, usually we say self-praise stinks, you know. Right. But I was very inventive and I did everything because I went through a lot from the beginning on mm -hmm. from the beginning when the war started mm -hmm. to be inventive mm -hmm. because I was I was I was 11 years old and I became the head of my household mm -hmm. because my father was taken away mm -hmm. my brother was useless totally useless he, he gave up from the very first time Yes, okay. yes, yes, yes. He couldn't comprehend this. People can do that. I think that this is something because he's very, he was very liberal. He was leaning to the left, you know. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. And to, to him, humanity was the atmosphere of everything. Right. And here, they're treating us like dirt. Right. That was interesting in the book when he went to, to Russia. To Russia yes. He came back. He came back. Exactly. I mean, at least he said he can sleep in my bed. And one meal a day. One meal a day. Yeah. Exactly. They already slept in the streets in Bialystok, you know, mm. which was a terrible, terrible. Uh, I don't know whether most people know about this. They probably do not, unless people who are very much interested in that process in that time. But uh, it's, it's unbelievable. You, you, you cannot no, possibly exactly. describe that. Because whatever you describe, it doesn't do you justice. Right. 
you know. This seems to be the, so I read, I read my, the choice, and then yours challenged my lab by, it's just been raining Holocaust memoirs yep. on me, and I've been reading them, and certain things, there does seem to be a certain, there's certain things that everybody who survived seems to Went through. Went through, but also the way they survived psychologically. Exactly, yes. 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 Exactly. Exactly. You know, Bridget, I tell you something. You know, I thought about this very quite often. Why didn't I become a drunk? Right. Or use drugs? Mm -hmm. I, to me, life was a drug. Right. Right. And, uh, Thank God I, I kept that way until now. Mm -hmm. Now I went to, I'm a, uh, not only a Holocaust survivor, I am also a veteran, a mm -hmm. Korean veteran. I went through two years, worst years of my life, I would say. Not, re not really. But it also opened up a window for me. I am thankful for the American army, for the American government, actually, that I, they drafted me. I could have abstained and I said, no, mm -hmm. I want to do something for my country. Mm -hmm. And I'm very happy I did it. I'm a, I am a very, I'm not a nationalist, right. don't misunderstand right. me, but I am a peace-loving man with rules and regulations that were made for men. Mm -hmm. And I abide by it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because I have to, otherwise I'd be lost. So many daily things that you oh. take for granted. Oh, yes. And as you see kind of the, the world now and the politics and a lot of the. Do you think it's good that people are kind of spoiled? Yes, to a degree, yes. Is that a good thing? It's a good thing and it's a bad thing. Right. <laughs> <laughs> if, if, you have want, if you want me to differentiate between the two, we would have to sit here for a very long time. But I, I tell you, Bridget, I, uh, I, I, maybe I'm, because of my age, I come from a totally different time. Right. I know, I was reading a totally it, different. your book, and it's, I mean, take away some of the electricity, and it's not far from yes. the way we lived in medieval times. That's right. You were that, doing your laundry. Yes, and 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 that's and right, that's right. It's not like you're no. I was I was saying to my friend, I said, I was even my therapist they were talking, and I was saying the difference in the way that you lived in your normal life before any of the horrific atrocities you had to endure. Yes. To me, it would seem in my privileged, you know, modern world with technology it would seem Primitive, yes. very, very <laughs> primitive. Absolutely, Just absolutely. That. Yeah. Did you read the whole book? Yeah. Oh, from front to end. From front to end in one day, and it's so good. Uh, I tell you. <laughs> I couldn't put it down. It's one of those things where you exactly. You, I can't put it down, but it's also it's yeah. the same the same experience with the choice. She's yeah, and she's a lot more graphic in some of the things that happened that she witnessed in Auschwitz, and uh, those images that she wrote are stuck in my head forever. And I can't imagine if you witnessed it. Of course, I, I of course I did. Of course I did. How do you, and I think that's the thing that people, I'm sure you've heard the question is, you know, maybe not how you wrestle with. Your hate, but you don't seem like a very hateful person. No, not at all. Um, but how do you how do you see the world as someone who has seen the worst of humanity, and what are we missing? You know, what would somebody like me perhaps miss? <laughs> it's a wonderful question <laughs> <laughs> that needs multiple answers. I know, I'm sorry. I ponder a lot. No, and it's quite all right. It's quite all right. Uh, Bridget, I tell you that I do not believe that we should say to our children, because I had it bad, I want you to have better. Mm -hmm. 
I don't believe in that. I do what I want to do for my child or my grandchild because it's our blood. And we have to do the best we can to bring him up to be human beings, responsible human beings, and not grow up with hate. Mm -hmm. That is my utmost prayer, mm -hmm. really. I, I would like everybody to be like me, but I know it's not possible. But if they come close, I, I'll be very, very much appreciative. Ah, come on! That's, 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 that's. They don't know the they don't know the word Hitler. They don't know the word Nazi. Right. They cannot comprehend what this is, right. what it was. So I started. You know, they would say, "Well, you need to educate yourself." And, you, and I had no a decent amount, but then I said, "Okay, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't want to be ignorant, so I'm going to go read and read about Hitler and the Nazis as a grown woman who and." I'm having a hard time. <laughs> no, you cannot. And if you are a, a decent human being, you cannot possibly comprehend the philosophy of Hitler. I can't comprehend it, but I also can't comprehend the flattening of that word. The way that I can't comprehend loosely throwing that around. Yeah, yeah. With, and without, even if you know. Oh, I, I agree with you. I agree with you 100%. No, they cannot because I tell you something. I read German. I read my Kampf. Mm -hmm. I read it in English and I read it in German. Mm -hmm. uh, this is, he was a lunatic. Yeah. And yet he persuaded a whole country of Germans. Would they have the most civilized in Europe at that time? They claimed. But then civilization is also a claim, you know? Right. We can claim anything. But how did the country that brought out Beethoven, that brought out Nietzsche, that brought out Kant, that brought out so many f philosophers and beautiful people, and Einstein, and, yeah. and, and then the list goes on and on and on. How could they possibly become such animals? Right. That's what never left me. Yeah. Never, ever. You know, I, I don't want to think about it, and I do not want to, but I do. But uh, how could they be so bestial? I guess this is my always aching wonder, you know, when I ask about the blind side of the human mind, is that we have so much blind spot where we're missing. Is, is it in all of us to be there? Is that potential in all of us? Yes, it is. But it does seem like some people, for instance, are more prone to it. <clears throat> or even going through your experience, there were people who would turn on their own people. Yes, survive, absolutely. Or there were people who would rather die and give their bread away so that someone else could survive. Yes. So, yes, yes. I agree to that 100%. And I'm not sure exactly what, it's like you can't really pin down what makes somebody, you and your brother, I, maybe it was believe he believed in different things than I did. That's right. I tell you something. The, the offering. It's. It's. I'm sure that you know about that. My father was an ardent Zionist. Mm -hmm. He always wanted to go to then Palestine, but because of the political situation, both of the English, he couldn't. Mm -hmm. But I, as his son, I hope for the same thing. Although I am a very proud American, but my soul is a Jew. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, I shall, and I love my people. I love all the people, but I specifically love my people yes. because we come from the same, we come from the same tribes. Yeah. And this was drilled into us. Mm -hmm. 
and rightfully so, because we always lived in the diaspora. And luckily, you have never lived in a diaspora, so it's very tough to imagine what life was like for a Jew in the diaspora. I had Polish friends, we were neighbors, and they gave me out to the Jew, 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 pointed, you know. Luckily, I was smart and I escaped, as you noticed in my book. As I noticed by you And um, I, don't even, I don't even hate him for it, because it was a time that they were, they were not uneducated. But they were the anti-Semitism was so deep in their soul. It's such a bizarre. And they had no reason. They had no reason whatsoever. And also, I'm, I'm, there are two things that I care about really that I've become very passionate about in the past two years. One is that Jews are Jewish, is one. And then the other is just anti-Semitism. It seems like it's a... a Lifelong conspiracy theory. Like as long oh, it's as been two thousand years. It's just <clears throat> so crazy to me. Yes. The, the hatred and yes. persecution. And my friend just got back from Rome, and she's Jewish, and she was telling me they took tours and was telling me about the history. They are like everywhere. Ghetto. Ghetto. I I know it very well. I, when was, I was in Prague. I was, they were telling me about. Oh, you were in Prague. Mm -hmm. Where about? I, Oh, I see, because I worked in Prague for, oh, okay. for quite a while. Oh, it's a fabulous place. Fabulous. Well, I was there under the communists, you know. Right. So, uh, well, that's what our, our guide was raised with the communist education and then came of age kind of as it switched over in the 90s. And so... Basically, of course, of course. I will tell you a few things about that if you were yes. interested. I was filming in, uh, I did, I was a film man, you know, and uh, I filmed in Prague for quite a while. And, uh, and it was a private studio, mm -hmm. illegal. It was, it had to go to communist party. Mm -hmm. But we found somebody who spoke our language. <clears throat> Excuse me. And while we were filming, our telephone went dead. Oh, no. And without the telephone, you know, when you're filming, you're dead. Mm -hmm. Especially in Prague. Mm -hmm. So we had a young man that I worked with very well. He did a lot of unconventional things for me. <laughs> <laughs> so he says, don't worry. We're going to have a telephone. Because if you, if you want to go through channels, it would take you two years right. to get it. Right. And we didn't have the time. So he says, uh, come and I show you what we do. I went with him and there's an Excelsior Hotel in, in Prague. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether you know it. Very beautiful hotel. We went in, there is a booth, and we were pretending we were calling. He cut the wire, and he says, we have a telephone. Oh and that's how we, that's how we had to, we had to organize things. Yeah. Because it was not a, it was not a normal time. No, and I don't Mm. And he's crafty. He always is looking for loops in the system. There's always a way. And yes. it's partially just because he grew up. And the dead system. Him. Exactly. And under a dictator. Yes. And so you're yes. always trying to find a way yeah. to get an actual role as well. Because I tell you, that was, that was also true in the camps. Mm -hmm. you, you looked everywhere where can you organize something to make you through the day. Right. That was our only thing. Food was the major thing, of, right, course, of course. Like always. And uh, and that's the way we had to live. Mm -hmm. That's the only way you had to live. Mm -hmm. Because the ones who couldn't do that did not survive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that was true of my brother. Mm -hmm. He was totally useless. Mm -hmm. Totally. And uh, But he gave up already when, when he went to Russia, you know. Right. When I when I think about those days, you know, I I lived it, but I sometimes don't believe it myself. I, know. I, I can't. I had to pinch myself, you know. Yeah. Was it really? Was it true? That's 
That's what's so interesting about the, the choice because she became a psychologist. Yeah. And Frankl was her mentor. Yeah, yeah. Frankl was a quite a man. I don't know. Do you know anything about Frankl? I only I read his book and and I love and in the choice she talks a lot about the reason that she doesn't have hate essentially is because you become a victim. She realized she went through a phase where she was very creative about humanity yes. and felt very cynical about um, this way that humans could be that horrible. And then realized that she basically became the victim of her jailers forever if she allowed that cynicism to penetrate her heart. And so the whole book is, the first part is about her mm. experience. The second part is about her healing. And then the third part is she wrote, you know, stories of her working with people. And yeah. She said the same thing you said. I don't want to feel different from you. Your no. experience is still like we, I, like I said, we all experienced the same thing in different variations. Yeah. But basically, it was the same thing. Right. We we were nothing. We were not even a a a worm. That you can step on, you know. But each and every one of us had their own will Mm -hmm. and uh, drive Mm -hmm. to survive. So you know what I what I went through. I don't have to tell you. And uh, this was basically not everything that I wrote, because I didn't want to scare people, you know. Because people say, "Ah, this is exaggerated." You know, people cannot do that. They do, they do, and more so, yeah. and more so. I think the hardest thing for me to comprehend, and it's the things that I didn't even consider, is the aftermath. The years that you spent this place without a country, without a family, without anything. And by the way, we didn't have trauma people who would come in and help. The no, just the opposite. Just the opposite. I tell you a story what happened when I came to New York. I wrote about Samuel's family, practically adopted me. Okay. And uh, they had a society from my town. And uh, my father, adopted father, called them together. He says, there is a young man who went through the Holocaust. So if you're interested, let's meet. You know. We met in his house. So we met and uh, I was astonished and devastated at the questions they asked me. They said, you know, we suffered too. We had to stay in line for gasoline. We had to stay in line for uh, sugar. I left the room crying. Mm -hmm. I couldn't believe it. Mm -hmm. I couldn't believe it. These are Jewish people who lost their families in my town. Mm -hmm. And they're giving me such stupid answers. Or questions, yeah. and I haven't said anything in forty years mm-hmm. until I wrote my book. Mm-hmm. I went through the army; nobody knew I was a Holocaust survivor. Wow! Nobody. That was like um, the, the woman who wrote the choice. She didn't say anything for forty years. Forty years, yeah. it's exactly. And in nineteen eighty-eight, that's when I bought my book. Oh wow! Okay, she wrote hers. She's ninety-two. She wrote hers. In 2017, she wrote it two years ago. Oh. Yeah. And she still remembers everything. Thank God. Yeah. I mean, she was the Auschwitz ballerina, so she had to dance for. I mean, that, that's the other thing that the sociopaths that were attracted to this uh, to Hitler that he had. In of course, of course. And he, but what did he do? He killed them all anyway. I love that they thought they were immune. Other than um, Mangrove, he lived, didn't he? Oh, yes. He just died a few years ago in Brazil. He had a heart attack on the beach. Yeah. Yeah. I tell you something. I faced him because he selected me. And he was waiting a few minutes. But I, you see, I had a trade. Right. I know, did I write my book about that? Probably not. You didn't write No? Okay. I was made, during the war, when the war started, I had a trade. You wrote about um, the trade of being a, you did, you made shoes, right? Yes. You were a cobbler. Yeah, not a cobbler. We, I, we made the upper shoes. Oh, okay. 
but it's called a shtepper in, oh, in Yiddish. Okay. And uh, in Russian, it's called a uh, gadatovchik. Okay. So uh, I said, he said, uh, how old are you? I told him I was two years older. And uh, he looked at me and he says, what did you do? I says, I was making boots for the SS, which was true. Right. So he was waiting a few minutes and he says, he put me to the rock. No, 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 I didn't write, I didn't write any names. Okay. I didn't write, I specifically did not write any names okay. because historically, maybe it wasn't so. Right. Maybe it was somebody else that I thought it was Mengele. I don't know. Right. I think it was Mengele yeah. because he was the major person who selected us. You know? And uh, so that, that, that kept me alive. That saved my life, let's put it this right. way. Not get me alive. Right, right. <laughs> Save my life. And it's so many little moments <clears throat> like that. Oh, yes. Like yes. Slip away yes, away. Ex exactly. I, you know, because I had experience with selections. Mm -hmm. And I knew where women and children are, stay away from them <laughs> if you want to live. <laughs> and that's exactly what I did. Oh, oh yes. So I had to. No, they're not. Wow. Not at that time. I'm sorry. Wow. Oh yes, oh yes. Oh yes, when I when I told them not what's happening, and they said, no, none of them believed me. None of them believed me. You know, yes, four children, four children with with tags, with their names. They're going to a. Youth, youth camp, that's exactly what they said. Mm -hmm. But I said, you're never going to see him again. Mm -hmm. Don't talk like that. He used to say, I mean, you're spreading lies. But what can you do? It's, uh, it was hard to believe, you know. Even for people who were already four years into German occupation and German atrocities and so on, they still couldn't believe that this is happening. I'd like to take a quick break so we can talk about our sponsor. They say it takes two months to form a habit, and if you're making a resolution this year, that can feel like a long time to wait to see results. With Calm, all it takes is five minutes a day to feel better, calmer, and ready to face whatever this year throws at you. Calm is the number one app for sleep, relaxation, and meditation. Calm has sleep stories, which are like bedtime stories for adults. They can help you fall into a deep, natural sleep in minutes, and stories are narrated by iconic voices like LeVar Burton and Nick Offerman. They also have soothing music from artists like Sam Smith, guided meditations, breathing exercises, and so much more to keep you relaxed and de-stressed. And if you go to calm.com slash walk-in, you'll get a limited time offer of 40% off a Calm Premium subscription, which includes hundreds of hours of programming. Over 60 million people use Calm. Join them today to accomplish your goals tomorrow. I do the daily meditation, the daily Calm, every single day. I love it. Well, maybe not every single day because I'm on a three-day streak currently, and it tells you this, which I also love. It keeps me accountable. And I love how simple it is. And every day there's a new theme. So today's theme was all about the impermanence of life. Yesterday's theme was all about focus. I cannot say enough about Calm. I was using Calm before they became a sponsor. I love it. And it's one of my favorite apps of all time. For listeners of the show, Calm is offering a special limited time promotion of 40% off a Calm premium subscription at Calm dot com slash walk in that's c a l m dot c o m slash w a l k i n that's forty percent off unlimited access to com's entire library and new content is added every week they are very good about this get started today at com dot com slash walk in that's com dot com slash walk in for a limited time promotion of forty percent off a com premium subscription. It was difficult. It was difficult. And I read these letters, and he was 21 years old, and I'm, I'm like, how did my grandmother 
was an alcoholic for the rest of his life. But I think about when you tell your story of all your brothers and sisters, my grandfather, my dad was on the tent. You know, it's, it would be like, God, all, yeah, and yeah. All, all of us gone. Yeah. It's just, I, I cannot get my mind around it. Yeah, but you, you oh yes, of course, of course, and they were collaborating with them, you know. A truck was more important than a person. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether you know that story that Churchill uh, was negotiating with uh, with uh, some Germans, and they wanted the Germans wanted a thousand trucks or whatever. I don't know that. I don't know the the exact amount, and he said no. A thousand Jews for a thousand trucks? It doesn't match up. But uh, but this this was continuously happening in Europe at the time, and it's beginning to happening here, which I scares the hell out of me. What do we do? We have to we have to talk to anybody we can and tell him. Show him, explaining that this is just dirty propaganda. That's all. Mm -hmm. Because you know, I always when I come to talk to with people not here in Germany, and they said, uh, you know, why, why hate? Why? And so I says, look, you have neighbors, don't you? He said, yes. I says, what if he cuts down one of your uh, bushes? You hate him. <laughs> why? Right. It's only a bush. So you replace it. But it, humanity doesn't work that way. No. We have different ideas about life. And each one of us has a different idea about life. You know, when I, when I speak to young people, and they are, very, they are very respectful, I will say. But I see some of them, you know, making faces and so on. So I do, that, that's why the reason why I did not write those atrocities in my book. Because I didn't want people to say, ah, he's telling a bunch of crap, you know. Well, the, the division is, you know, look, and uh, even, you don't, uh, you have to talk to Ahmadinejad in, in, in Iran, mm -hmm. and to uh, all those bastards that live around the world that try to change history. I always say, when they say to me, it never happened. I say, you know, the Civil War never happened. Slavery never happened. But you have to think logically and be educated. Right. Education, education. This is my mantra for life. It doesn't seem... To penetrate them. Well, and I'm not sure that our educational systems, and I don't think all of them... No, they don't. I can see that from my granddaughter. Mm -hmm. She's 14 years old. She's going to be 14, God bless her. Mm -hmm. She is an honor student, mm -hmm. straight A's. Just got a golden award mm -hmm. last week. And I asked her, what did, what did they teach you in history? Oh, she said, we are now uh, on, on Caesar. I said, wonderful. How, how long are you going to talk about Caesar? Well, just that day. Thank you very much. Yeah. You, you understand what I'm trying to say? I have nothing to say. And I said, you know, what did you guys think about the recent election? I was just trying to get where they're at. What do you think they're in the election? And what did you think? Yes. And they said, is Trump Republican or Democrat? <laughs> and I mean, that's actually a fair question. Yeah, it is a fair question. <laughs> But it was so funny. Oh, and then the other one said, I don't know, but it seems like a lot of people were butthurt about it. And they had teachers coming in and crying. You know, so their perspective is it, it wasn't like, oh, this is an election and a democracy, and maybe somebody was elected, you know, like them, and the power will change again. This is like an existential crisis. So they're, they don't understand from their perspective. They don't have enough knowledge, or they don't—they they don't know what to think about it. They just are got kids who teach Sure, sure. Which I'm not sure is. It's not the right thing. It's the right thing either. <laughs> it, it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be. But I can understand the emotions of people. Of course. 
we're, yeah. we're all very emotional. Some at the wrong time, maybe, and uh, some don't want to admit the truth to themselves that they're emotional, mm -hmm. which is most of the time. Mm -hmm. I I tell you something. I have never used any uh, psychiatrist or sociologist or whatever, and sometimes I'm sorry I didn't mm -hmm. because I would have been the perfect candidate for that. I do have cousins in France who are psychiatrists, maybe like three of them, and good ones too. Mm -hmm. And uh, they always observe me. And I says, uh, Serge, why are you, are you, are you pleased? <laughs> 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 oh, yes. And I know that. I know that. I know I'm a study. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, it, when somebody grows up, normally, what we call normal, quasi normally, right. there is not much that you can probably get out of someone unless he didn't get enough candies or enough <laughs> chocolate or whatever. But in my case, it was a different story. Mm -hmm. You know, this is an abnormal upbringing, mm -hmm. an abnormal childhood. Mm -hmm. Don't forget, I was 11 years old and I, I became, yes, and I lost five and a half years of my youth. Mm -hmm. And I was a raw potato because I had four classes of public school. My fifth one, the war broke out and that was it. Wow. I couldn't go to school anymore. I had to hustle. You read in my book what I did. Yeah. And I continuously hustled because I had to support my family. That's everything from, from A to Z. And, uh, but what I'm trying to tell you is, of course I would have been a candidate for a psychiatrist. But I never used drugs. I never used alcohol. Never is too much said, but I had a drink, but never in excess. And now I am sorry that I didn't. I sh maybe, no, no, not about the alcohol. <laughs> no. Oh, God. No, I mean about about the drug problem, you know. I abhor it, mm -hmm. and I dislike it. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's necessary. If you do it for medical reason, I can see it. Mm -hmm. Yes. But just for kicks, yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I tell you a story. <laughs> I, had, I was doing a lot of therapy, physical therapy. Mm -hmm. I had a therapist who was using marijuana. Mm -hmm. She told me that. She, there was no secret. And she said to me, if you ever would like to try it, maybe it will help you. Mm -hmm. uh, so I said to, I spoke to my wife. I says, what have I got to lose? Let's, let's try it. But she says, I have it in cookie form. Oh, she gave me one and she cut it in eight. Well, it was fine. It didn't, didn't do any spectacular. But you know, human beings, if you try a little bit and it helps, try a little bit more. So I took a double piece, and it was as big as a thumb. Right. Not bigger. Right. As a thumbnail, I mean. And I had such a bad night. I was hallucinating. I said, what is this? Yeah. No, no, that's all. one time. That's only one time right. I took it. Right. And I, she came the next day. I said, uh, I'm not going to mention any names. I said, listen, darling, I cannot use it. Thank you very much. I gave her back the whole thing. Right. I said, I don't want to see it or hear about it. I want to keep my brain right. in order. Enhance your being? No. To separate from what was going on in my house when I was growing up. It was just like, uh, it was... Doesn't help. No, it didn't. didn't. Just the opposite. I mean, it helped. I look back and at the time... At the time it helped. I think it did help. Yes. And then I just kept going through it. Because I don't, I don't know that I could necessarily... 
stories. In the same way that in many of these stories, people create their own worlds that they escape into in their mind, I was just checking out of my mind. Mm. Um, and it was not anywhere near the You couldn't cope thing. with it. You couldn't cope with it. Yeah, I couldn't cope with it. So I kept on doing it, and then it got worse, and then, you know, I got sober six years ago. So, and I love being... That's what I just wanted to say. That's right. That's exactly what I say. Yeah. To me, life is high. Yeah. I don't need any pills yeah. to make it better. Yeah. Yeah. I know. Why does anyone else? I, I know. No, but, but they do. It's I, I, you know, I tell you something. What I think is ethics, family ethics. I firmly believe in that. Family, family ethics. Mm-hmm. If you grow up in a family mm-hmm. that you, with ethics, human ethics, right. and any ethic that you mm-hmm. want to choose, you will become a better person mm-hmm. and you will not resolve to drugs. That's my personal opinion. I might be totally wrong, but I always take myself as an example. Like I said before, I would have been a candidate for everything, for juvenile delinquency, for you name it. You know, I came here in 1947. This is a 19-year-old. With $2 in my pocket that I spend on a taxi. (laughs) Foolishly. Not immediately, no, no. Well, yeah, yeah. No, it, it, it was legit. He didn't want to steal from me, but I was on, on uh, 103rd Street on Broadway, and I had to go to Canal Street for $2. <laughs> but uh, I survived. I had to survive, let's put it this way. It wasn't easy. If somebody tells you it was easy, I was without a language. I spoke four other languages, but not English. Yeah. Did you go right to school? Oh, yes, I went to night school, right. And what did you do when you got to America? No, I went to night school here in America. No, that's what I mean. What did you do? What did you work and then go to night school? Yes. Okay. I worked at jobs that you will not believe. <laughs> 50 cents an hour, and glad to have it because there was nothing else Mm -hmm. that I could do at that time. Mm -hmm. I didn't know the language. I was what they called a greener. You know what a greener is? It it was green in our ways. So uh, it was very difficult Mm -hmm. until I went into the army. I went into the army in 1950, and uh, I worked on Canal Street. And I, when I started out, I worked for 50 cents an hour. Mm-hmm. And then I advanced to a different job and a different, totally different. Uh, different field? No, no, the field was the same. Oh, okay. But like different different circumstances, oh, okay. totally different circumstances. You know, I, I was working, uh, I was clocking the, the clock, you know, to say. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, when they, it was a uh, seasonal work. Okay. There were seasons that were busy, 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 and then it was nothing. Mm-hmm. So when we was busy, they kept me on a salary, mm-hmm. and I was a good worker. Mm-hmm. I knew my craft. Let's put it this way. Mm-hmm. And then when it got slow, he says, "Oh, you're going to work piece work," and I was waiting for that. And I started work peace work, and I made three times as much money. Wow. And he didn't like it. <laughs> <laughs> but we were always continuously on a collision course, you know. Right. He was was a union place, but mm. he disregarded me as a union member, and he kept with the with the union member, whoever. I mean, with the union. Uh, Brass, whoever they were, and they wanted to cheat me. 
And I went up to the union and I told them that. And they said, if you don't like it, you can quit. So I took out my book, my union book, and I threw it on the table and said, here, you go and work. Yeah. You will never see me again. <laughs> and I swore that time, never will I ever be working for anybody. Wow. And I didn't. Oh, wow. <laughs> and uh, my boss, when I went into the army, he said to me, he said to me, uh, Jack, he called me Jack. That time. That's why you should not be called Jack anymore. <laughs> Jacob anymore. Uh, so uh, he said to me, you've been a good man and you're going into the army. I'm going to give you a $50 bonus. That time $50 was a lot of money. That was 1950. I thanked him and I said to him, I, I forgot his name. I said, I'm going to tell you something. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure working for you. It wasn't a pleasure, but it was a pleasure. <laughs> you uh, never see me again, ever. And he never did. But that was me. I, I was a stubborn. I still am stubborn. Very stubborn. Still? Still, yes. You ask my daughter and she will tell you, you're my dinosaur, she says. <laughs> And you're stubborn, that's why you're around. I am, I, I, that's one thing, uh, Bridget. Whatever I undertook, I accomplished. Right. I have accomplished so much in my life. Yeah, it sounds like it. Uh, this is just, uh, this is nothing. Nothing, really. I mean, it's, it's a lot. It's a lot, but it's nothing, you know. it's only part. Exactly. Yeah. It's part of my youth. Right. right. My childhood, right. actually. This is my childhood. Yeah. What happened afterwards is a totally different story. It must be so surreal. Yeah, I wrote a book and it's 480 pages. It's called The Refugee. Wow. And you can't read it? No. <laughs> it's a tease. It's a tease, I know. I know. It's such a tease. I, I, I wrote, want to read it. I read this in one day. I tell you. One of the, I said to my wife, after my demise, I told to Rachel, actually, my daughter, you can publish it, but not before. Mm -hmm. I have to respect the wishes of my wife. Mm -hmm. Of course. And you, how long have you and your wife been together? 60 years. And where, where did you meet? We met in Vienna. Okay. I was an opera singer. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's another capital of my life, you see. You did say in the book that you and your brother sang at one point. Yes, and that would save my life. Mm -hmm. Again. I also say... I wanted to write a book saying for bread. Right. Which in essence exactly what I did. You did, yes. And that saved my life. Mm -hmm. But uh, I do what I can. What can I tell you? I did what I could. And now I am on the way out. <laughs> I have accomplished what I wanted to accomplish. And I hope I have some good more years. Mm -hmm. But it's up to the, to the forces, you know. Very orthodox. So it like very, very, very yes. orthodox. And you had all the different holidays. And absolutely, different absolutely. I mean, st I still observe it here. And that's Every right. holiday. Okay. And are you, are, do you believe in God? At that time I did. When you were little? Yes. Okay. Very much so. Oh. Do you still have a faith in God? I, I have a faith... I still have faith in humanity, as odd as it might sound. That is odd. <laughs> Very odd. I understand it, though, and I don't. It's the same paradox. So yeah, I know it's a paradox. Because in, in, in all of those moments of horrificness, there were moments of people who had mercy, extended grace, yes. gave you bread, yes. helped you along the way. So yes. I can see why you would see it as a you know what Frankel said? There are two kinds of people. There are good people and bad people. And I believe in that. It was, I spoke to Frankel quite often, you know, because we were in the same camp, as I said. Mm -hmm. Camp number four and covering. Wow. And, uh, of course, you know, don't forget, I, I was a child. Mm -hmm. Really a child. Mm -hmm. I have lived ten lives, Sounds but I was still a child. What does a, a child of 11 to 16 and a half 
when I was liberated, what does he know right. except the art of survival? Right. Nothing else. Right. Nothing else mattered. Right. It almost benefited you in a weird way. Of course. Because of course. you didn't have the knowledge of what you didn't know anything else. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. You know I was a raw potato, like I always yeah. say. I had four classes of public school, which gave me a basic education, yes. But that's about all. When I, I was a raw potato when I was liberated, you know, after 16 and a half years. Mm -hmm. But I also was like a sponge. I absorbed everything. Everything and anything that came my way. That's the part that I'm so interested in is you're a child. You grow up in this insane... Circumstances. Circumstances. And then to come to America. That was a different world. I know. It's, it's got to be like... They thought I came from a different planet. Yeah. <laughs> and I thought I was from a different planet, too. That was something else that struck me in all in your memoir and um, Avars's, the uh, trains going by and looking out and noticing what's going on is normal. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I couldn't comprehend. How, 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 how do you get to first base with it? Right. It was very difficult. Very, very difficult. The first couple of years for me was very, very difficult. As a matter of fact, I think if I had the chance, I would have gone back to what? I don't know. Right. Because there was nothing for me. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. But horror. Else. I didn't know anything else. Right. Exactly. Right. But slowly, I will say that was, I give great credit to the children of the Samuels, the people that adopted, that wanted to adopt me. Mm -hmm. They were two young college girls that drilled me and drilled me in the English language. They, they said uh, they didn't understand anything else. They, I spoke Yiddish to them, but uh, they made no sense of what they answered me. So they kept on, you got to, you got to, you got to. And I thank and to this day, may they rest in peace. But it was... It was not very pleasant to be a stranger in a strange land. Oh my gosh, right. And top of, that's what's so interesting about your story and why I want to read your second book is because not only do you, I don't know even how you process anything or if you even had a chance to because now you're going through all the stuff and then there's, like you said, nothing to go back to, but then you're thrown into trying to figure out life in a whole Different life, yes. <clears throat> so it's almost like, and again, you're still young, you're 19, so you're still a child. Yes, you're I was a child. And As I said, I was an old man, but yet a child. Yeah. Because I lived 10 lives. Yeah, and it's not... But yet I was I was a tender 19-year-old. Yeah, just trying to figure To out survive, out. survive. Well, again, yes, again yes. trying to survive. Yes, it's yes. Just, and you are truly the definition of... A survivor. a survivor. And this, I always ask myself, would I be, if I had gone through one fraction of what you experienced, in how, would you, how would you would tolerate I be just it? a bitter old person? I feel no. like I would be just. I'm not. I'm not. <clears throat> I don't know what I would do because you can't know. No, of course, we're all different. Right. But I tell you something my education helped me a great deal. Right. Because I went to night school in New York. Then I worked in the theater in New York off Broadway. Mm -hmm. Then I went to television school and I knew I had, don't have enough. So I went to Vienna to study. I'd like to take a quick break so we can talk about our sponsor. Do you have a to-do list that never seems to end, running from a flight straight to a meeting? Still have to cook dinner for yourself? Beta Brands Dress Pant Yoga Pants are perfect for the office, home, and anywhere your day takes you. Stylish, comfortable, professional attire. You shouldn't have to pick one. With Beta Brand, you never have to sacrifice comfort or function for style. Beta Brand's dress pant yoga pants are super comfy, perfectly stretchy, and stay wrinkle-free. They have all the style of dress pants with the stretch, fit, and feel of yoga pants. Whatever your style, Beta Brand has the pants to match. Choose from dozens of colors, patterns, cuts, and styles like boot cut, straight legs, skinny, cropped, and more. They even have a pair with eight 
Yes, eight pockets. And now they also offer premium denim with the same flexibility and comfort as yoga pants. As someone who basically lives in yoga pants because I work from home and many of us do work from home now, but then I have to run out to a meeting or to a lunch or to a coffee or someone's coming by for a podcast and I need to look somewhat professional, the Beta brand is perfect for me. These pants are comfortable and stylish and you can't really tell that I'm basically wearing yoga pants because they don't look like yoga pants at all. They look like really classy business slacks. I love them. I'm obsessed with them. Right now, our listeners can get 20% off their first order when you go to betabrand.com slash walk-in. That's betabrand.com slash walk-in. 20% off your first order at betabrand.com slash walk Walk in. Millions of women agree these are the most comfortable pants you'll ever wear to work. Honestly, best pants for traveling. Best, best, best pants for traveling and flying. Go to betabrand.com slash walk in for 20% off. Did you ever feel depressed? Oh, yes. Were there ever? Oh, very much so. Mm-hmm. Very much so. And you didn't go to therapy or anything? No. How no. Did you deal with I, I dealt with it myself. I dwelt into knowledge. Right. That's why I say, that's why I wrote my book 40 years later. I sang and I produced. I was a reporter. I was uh, a producer. You name it, the whole bit. I even made a film about with Pope John II, a three hour film, a documentary, three hours in three different languages. Uh, what five languages do you speak? I speak. Yiddish, I speak Polish, German, some English, <laughs> and um, Hebrew. Okay. Do you speak any Russian? I speak some. some. Do you speak any Russian? No. no I, I can make myself understand in all Slavic languages. Okay. I speak Czech if I have to, and I get by with Italian, I get by with some Spanish, uh, a mixture of... Uh, of all trades, you know. Yes. But life has formed me that way, and, and there is nothing I can do about it. What is your, what is your hope for <clears throat> the younger people? You, <clears throat> do you feel optimistic about things? Yes. You do? Yes. I have to be. So even in, even in, in the darkest days, you were always optimistic. Always optimistic. You know, and my father's words. Survive. That kept me going. Mm-hmm. If it wouldn't have been for that, I don't know. Maybe I would have given up too. Yeah, yeah. That, but that right. those walls ring in my ears, mm-hmm. and probably will for the rest of my life. Mm-hmm. Uh, that seems that was one of the ones that when I was. <laughs> I believe you. I just, I just, it's, uh, because uh, a fourteen-year-old child lecturing to his father. And it's, it's not natural. Let's put it this way. Yeah. It shouldn't be that way. And even hearing uh, about your mother, just how you, you know, her spirits, like she seemed to do her best, but her spirits... It was gone. Uh, yeah. It's a terrible, it was a terrible, terrible time. And I do think it's so important that we don't forget. No, we mustn't because forget. there was some poll recently that 60% of kids under uh, a certain age don't know about the of course, of course. That's crazy. But I tell you something, it's, uh, maybe it's better they don't know. Is it? I don't think so. I don't think so either. I don't think so. But sometimes I wonder, should they know? How can a child, you know that our granddaughter, she's 14 years old, and I have a grandson, he's 10. They know nothing, nothing about the Holocaust. Nothing. I wanted to give my daughter, I uh, spoke to, she had bat mitzvah in, in last September. So I said to her, I would like her to read you. I would like her to give my book to read. She says, no. Is she right? I don't know. I know that the child knows something because she's very smart. Yeah. She's very bright. I feel like I read Night when I was like 14. Oh, you did? Yeah. Um, from Giselle. Well, I think I was very young when I read it. I, I remember because I was 
it's always something that stuck out to me from yeah. my studies when I was young. I mean, I think she should know. I think she, she, I, I will slowly lead her into it. But I know that she, she must know. Is it just the fear that there'll be? It's not my fear. No, the, I, not my your daughter. Fear. Your, my daughter. Your daughter or parents or teachers yeah. or educators <clears throat> is the fear that the kids can't handle it. Yeah, I tell you, yes, I don't think they can unless they're at a certain age. When I was lecturing in Germany, I said that my first thing that I said to the people who were organizing it, I said, no children. Uh -huh. I don't want any children below 15 or 16. Okay. Because why, why bother them with that trauma? I, I agree, but also... I they should know. I agree, but also I see the, there, these kids are online. I mean, maybe not your granddaughter, but... The kids that I know are the average 14, 15, even 10 year old. They're very online. And they see things on YouTube and I, they have <clears throat> shootings and there is all. Shootings, of yes. Shootings, yes. Sex, yes. Let them have that. Right. Let them have their shootings and their sex. <laughs> but not this. <laughs> but not the Holocaust. <laughs> no, well, I tell you something. You know, my daughter, uh, my grandchild always says to me, not to me, to her mother, she says, Mom, how come I, when I Google you, I, I don't see anything. And when I Google my grandfather, he is all over the place. Mm. So she must know something. Yeah, yeah. You know, she yeah. must. Yeah, I think so, because she doesn't want to admit it. Of course not. Of course not. I know. I know. I believe you. I believe you. I mean, eventually she will know. You know, because even my daughter, mm -hmm. until she was 13, I did not tell her anything. Wow. It was very difficult. Right. But when she started to ask questions, I said, now is the time to tell her. I, may, I had made her read my book mm -hmm. because she was uh, editing it. Oh. That's when she found out. Okay. Uh, Not before. Right. I don't think, because I know a lot of Holocaust survivors drummed into their children's heads all those atrocities, and I didn't think it was right. Okay. I don't think it's right because they should grow up normally, not have to worry of what happened to their grandparents, right. or their uncles, or their aunts. But I guess the idea is that it's to prevent it from happening again. Yes, but you do you think that a child of seven... No, I don't think a child of seven could. I don't even think a child of 13 or 14. I mean, I think I was pretty exposed to some things by the time I was that age, but I, I know that I was exposed to lots of yeah. What did you have any uh, in your family? Any? No, no. I just know that I was exposed to it in school, and so I don't know. When, in school, when you say in school, what school did you go to? If I may ask. I moved every year and a half. Oh. So was it a Hebrew school? A, no. a, a regular school? I, a public school? I, might have just, I feel like it was just a teacher who had us reading. Oh, that possible, was, possible, was possible. Teacher, I feel very soul connected to, I don't know why, when I, I was a little kid in Catholic school, and prior to Catholic school, we had nuns, and I was probably the kindergarten, and they said, everybody, it was around Christmas, and they said, everybody who's celebrating Christmas, raise their hands. And, and they, you, you didn't. And I did, but then they said, and everybody who's celebrating Hanukkah, please raise your hands, and I felt, I raised my hands. Oh, you raised them twice. <laughs> and they thought that I, they said, <clears throat> they asked my parents if they, you know, if we were part Jewish or if they didn't know something. Because here I was the friend, and I was the only kid. Yeah, like, yeah. <clears throat> so I don't know. Oh, I can understand that. I can. But you know, I because now I <laughs> maybe I just maybe I read that book on my own. My, my granddaughter asked me, "Do you know who Anne Frank was?" 
I says, what did you learn about it? Oh, I, I, we, had, we had one class about it. Okay, so they're learning. They're learning, but I didn't tell her. Right. I didn't. See, that's what I think it is different. I don't know whether I'm doing the right thing or not. Well, it's, it's interesting. <clears throat> it's interesting. Yes, and it's different in the own family. Yes, exactly. No. First of all, all my survivor friends have passed away. I have one. He lives in uh, he lives in Germany, but he's building a house now in. In Washington, with his where his children are, he's alone. He's a widower, but he didn't go through what I went through. He went through totally something different. He was hidden for two years in an attic, and there was a film made about him. If you want to see it, I can tell you the name. Yeah, hidden in silence. Okay. It's called. Okay. But as far as I'm concerned, you know, we we don't talk about those things. Right. Very very seldom, and even with my. Friends, when they were alive, we didn't talk. You know when we talked about those things? When we were at the Simcha, you know, at the wedding. It was a festivity or so. We looked at each other and have to say, look, we have lived to see this. Right. And they, either we are robots or, or unhuman or, or we don't right. know. We don't know. Yeah, that is what it would be. I imagine very... It's a very, very tough question. Very tough to answer. I think so. I think so because she will know it. When the time comes, I will tell her. Right. And I would, because I have a book for her, of course, and she will read the others as, that I've written. I've written three books altogether. And, uh, and I'm, I was on my fourth one. I became blind. What can I tell you? Oh, uh, it's not the same. I was collaborating with somebody. You know, you don't speak any Yiddish, do you? You don't understand it. In Yiddish, we say, or in German, you don't speak German either. No. With strange hands, it's good to mix a manure. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny, I got a, a document <clears throat> and I had a handwriter and I had somebody else type for me. And yeah, me of course, and it can't be. Have but you, why don't you use a, uh, a uh, recorder? I know, it's, that's what I keep on saying, and they don't believe me. <laughs> they don't believe me, you know. I'm in the middle of a book, and uh, I, I can't come any further, you know. Yeah, there's something about the brain. Everything, exactly. It's, uh, what things are you right? Um, I did write about sex and Mr. Hefner. Is he still alive? No, he passed away. Oh, you passed away? Maybe a year ago or two. Mm. And his widows? And his widows. <laughs> many widows. And he left a son. And, oh, God. And then I started writing about culture stuff. Like, yeah. the, I don't know, I kind of stumbled into culture wars. Why not? Culture is nothing wrong with culture. Yeah, I just feel... Um, it's, it, the only thing is you have to know enough about the culture. That's But you can, you can, you can. But I also feel like more. No, 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 no. That you're not. No, I just don't feel like when I see certain people talk about they have an expansive knowledge of history, even just the history of our country, and I don't feel so I can comment on what trends I'm seeing in the culture presently, and I see a lot of the. the, It's very divided right now. Yes, of course, of course. And them, and I feel but it, we will merge. I, I am a firm believer in that. Yeah, I, I, I believe that too. Actually. Yeah. I, I think that people need to talk and let other people talk, even if they don't agree with them. This is where I'm, that's what I push back against a lot. It's just like, let them speak. You don't have to. Be of course. Them, but that of course. Of course. No. Speak. Silence is, is a killer. Yeah, that's, uh, I mean, it's strange times, but mostly. 
I wake up every day and feel grateful, and I go to bed every day. Giant, you know, I do that. No, I'm still, <laughs> still I working. It's crazy. I, I, I think it's but you are a youngster. My God, you have a whole life ahead of you, I, Bridget. <clears throat> you, but, it's not that you should feel it. It is that way. It is that way. But then there's things, you know, that happen that are random, like even Kobe Bryant is a good example of this. Where we These are tragedies. Don't tragedies. No, no. So, I always say, you know, in Hebrew, there is a word, it's a Hayom Harat Olam. Now is the last day of your life wow. that you know. Right. Because you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. You don't know what's going to happen in an hour. Mm -hmm. That's why I, I believe in that. It is truly a new program and it's one day at a time. Of course, and absolutely. Goals you should have. Those has nothing to do with it. You should have your goals and pursue them. At the same time, be realistic mm -hmm. about your dreams. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can dream of almost anything out of space, too. <laughs> but uh, it's never going to happen. Yes, and yes. I was, I was sitting down because I was reading Nathan's memoir, and then your memoir, I was going to write a piece about just the resilience of the human spirit. And how I would like to read it. And how optimistic you both seem. And yes, I am. I am. And I know, and this is, a, this is a question I have, is that I know a lot of people right now, and I see them online, particularly on Twitter, and it's constantly an existential crisis. It's the end of the world. They'll be saying, I am literally fighting for my life. Why? From their couch. <laughs> Why? Why? What is it that is so horrible that they have to fight for their life? What? What is it? Like I said, you know, uh, I know a lot of people who are very dissatisfied with their lives. Right. I know a lot of people who are very satisfied with their life. But this is a choice that you have to make. Exactly. You can see that there might need to be changes in society and life, but that doesn't mean that it's an existential crisis. It's, it, is it is not. It is not. It is not. Survival. Is a that is an existential <laughs> question. Right. But otherwise, nothing. Nothing. Nothing in this world that cannot be fixed. You know, the things that they would say would be like the healthcare system is killing people. Oh, but they're also healing us. I always say the same thing. What would we do without it? Right. They're keeping us alive. Mm -hmm. Look, in my country, where I came from, where I was born, I would have been dead already 50 years ago. Right. But this medicine keeps me alive. Mm -hmm. As good or bad as it is. Mm -hmm. it's, all, it's, it's relative. It's all relative. Ask me as many as you want to. What would you say to someone about how to best counter hate? How to counter hate? Mm -hmm. Be an example. Not, not, not exactly. <laughs> I have never been in a fight in my life. Never. When I was in the army, I was the only Jew in my army, in my outfit. I was with rebels. Never met a Jew in their life. When I came into the company, I put on my duffel bag. And I said to the master sergeant, my name is Jack Bressler. I'm a Jew, I'm a foreigner, and I'm a Yankee. And you should have seen those faces. But you want to tell, I tell you something. Those people loved me after a while. I was their master speller in the company, although I was only here for two and a half years. And uh, they respected me because I respected them. I told them, if you want my respect, you have to respect me first. Then we would get along fine. And then for two years, I was in the army, the master sergeant said to me, as an adieu to me, as goodbye, yes. he said, Mr. Bressler, I'm going to tell you something. I respected you from the day you came to me. And he knew why, because I didn't make any fuss. I told him exactly the way it is, but I never told him I was a Holocaust survivor. And uh, I fared very, very well. To put sugar on the cake, I went to Germany as occupation forces. Wow. I was one and a half years in Germany. Oh, wow. 
<laughs> as an American soldier. Yeah. Do I have to tell you more? No. Okay. <laughs> that's why I say I am, I'm very grateful that I had the chance to serve in the army. I, will never, I am a very proud American. And uh, I just sent away a letter to the Daughters of the Legion, a survey about uh, what I think about the flag and so on. I'm the only one in this street, in this part of the street, that hangs out a flag at every occasion. And uh, I have had Americans that laughed at me, made fun of the flag. And I said, if you knew how many people gave their lives for that flag, that's, that's me. And uh, I will not change for anybody. I don't care. Trump or, or not Trump, it doesn't make it. I voted for eight presidents in my life. And every time I was a Democrat, I was born a Democrat, I think. Mm -hmm. Whether I will die a Democrat, I don't know. <laughs> Party, is Party is changing. Yes, if, if a representative like Omar on Shalit can question my loyalty for my country, mm -hmm. there's something wrong with our Congress. Something wrong. And it, it hurts me a lot. It hurts me. It distresses me because that's not what they, they brought all their garbage from Somalia and from the West Bank. All those all, I don't even want to express it, how I feel about that garbage about the Jews into this country, into Congress. No, that's, that's where we part company. And I am, I don't want to, predict anything, but I don't think I'm going to stay in the, in the Democratic Party. I was, I was just telling you that I'm learning about culture, but I was very liberal, and I got pushed to the middle. And I was very liberal by the party, essentially. I believe in it. I know, I know. And I'm not saying everything on the right No, is, no not every, everything, everything is black and white. No, yeah. no, absolutely not. Um, but to spread some vicious, vicious propaganda. I am the Benjamin. Yes, I am the Benjamin. I'm very proud to be a Benjamin. And a lot of people say that Trump's rhetoric, you know, on the left, I hear that Trump's rhetoric is blaming uh, me. The left, me. the left will blame Trump for everything. You know, I uh, Let me put it this way. I know exactly what Trump is. I knew it before he became president, and I wasn't surprised. He did not surprise me, but there's one thing I will tell you. At least he says things that should be done, even if he doesn't do it. He doesn't play around. I have two questions I want to ask that I ask everyone who comes on my show before, before we wrap up. What are your biggest defects in character? I'm too good. <laughs> Literally, yes. I don't think I have a, a bad bone in my body. Mm -hmm. Honestly, I'm too good. Maybe that was part of why I survived up till now. Yes, they did, but um, I didn't let them. Let's put it this way. They tried, many tried, in many ways, because, you know, I was in business all my life. and. Uh, I did crazy things that uh, you would not even believe. But people did try to take advantage, yes. And they did. But uh, what I did is I did not let them. And if I seen that it's getting critical, I parted with those people, in business especially. So why do you think that's a, a bad thing? Why I think that's a bad thing? Because maybe I felt I don't want to fight too much. Right. You know. What else did you want to ask me? My greatest assets, my resilience. Yeah. <laughs> That's why I told you my daughter calls me the dinosaur. Yeah. You know, I have a wonderful family. Uh, we are very close. I have a wonderful son-in-law. He's a sweetheart, and we love him dearly. And uh, when I look at my family, this is my greatest assets, mm -hmm. my greatest pleasure. And uh, I'm happy that I've lived to that day to see my granddaughter get 
to be bat mitzvah. I never thought it's going to happen. But again, this is life. And uh, to be good to each other, love your family, love your people around you, and spread love all over the world. That has been my mantra ever since I can remember. And I, I don't think I can add anything to it, really. What else is there? We, we shall overcome. Oh, you want to know why anti-Semitism? Yeah. You don't know why? I don't, well, I don't understand. <laughs> well, I tell you, a lot of it has got to do with the, with the Christian world, with the crucifixion of Jesus. Okay. Because they still think that the Jews killed Jesus Christ. That was the first anti-Semitism that was spread among the, the people. Because they don't know their history. Very simple. If they would know, they wouldn't do it. They would think differently. But I have heard it all my life. And even today, sometimes I hear it. But I know what to answer them. I tell them, read your history. And really read it and understand it. Then you will see that it is not the Jews that did crucify him. This, I think, is was the most spread way of Anti-Semitism. Mm -hmm. Second, they're jealous. Right. That seems like a Look throughout the history. We are just 0.2% of the population of the world, mm -hmm. but we have 23% of laureates. Yeah. It's always seen, right, there is and they, and they, they openly say that. I mean, with the people that I have come in contact, you know. Okay. I've, uh, I want you to know, I always said this thrown at me, you know. And, uh, but I knew how to defend it. And I have always said, knowledge is bliss. Right. But some of them, I, I have, I, you know, I can sit and talk to you here for ages and tell you stories about what I've done, what, how I have acted with people. I have some of my best friends. You have heard that before. They say some of my best friends are Jews, yes? Right. But literally, one of my dearest friends is a German. I had another one in Vienna that just passed away. He was in the Hitler Youth. Wow. And uh, I brought him. He knew nothing about Judaism or Jews. All he knew was Jews are vermin. The propaganda from the Third Reich. Right. But I have brought him to a point where he made a film about Chaim Gebürtig. I don't know whether you know who that is was a composer, a Jewish composer, and he made a film. It was a collaboration with me, of course. It was my idea, and uh, he won the Golden Prize in Germany for it. Wow. I still have it. And, uh, was he, I mean, that's got to be so weird to be a different youth. I'll tell you something. He took me around in Germany. I met his mother. I met his family. Wow. I'm, still, I'm still friends with his family. As a matter of fact, they just called me. Why, why don't we hear from you? I called, I, we call every month, you know. Right. Then Vienna, and he died, he passed away, he was 94. Um, he was a producer and director, and uh, we worked for 15 years together. What they, how did they reconcile that? How did they reconcile that? Because they're good people. His wife and his children are good people. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, his son, he said, in one of those high schools that I have uh, lectured in Vienna, he said, my uncle wrote a book. And they said, how does he call me your uncle? People in the class. Right, right. So we said, he is like my uncle. Right. I knew him since he was born. Right. I'm still with them today, right. 45 years later. Right. What, why, how they reconcile? They're good people, that's all I can say. Right. Good people can reconcile with almost anything. Mm -hmm. But if you are a bad character, nothing will help you. Mm -hmm. You cannot convince him. They knew I was a Jew. I knew, they, I knew where they came from. I mean, his family now, I met him before he married, you know, and he died in the meantime. But uh, I have a lot of those things. I have the 
the Lord Mayor of Landsberg, was a friend of mine. I speak to him every month, once a month. I know his family, he was here. I have contact to Germans and uh, I don't feel that I should put them down. Right. It's the worst thing that you can do is put somebody down. Mm -hmm. So she's German. Yeah. She's German. She's a German. Is she Jewish? No. And then she's a German. Yeah, she's German. If she's Jewish, she's a German Jew. But, but she is German. Yes, they're doing a lot in Germany. It's one thing I would say. More so than any country in Europe. Yes, but they're on top of it. And, uh, you know, there is so much to talk about this. Do you know that most of the garbage of anti-Semitic writings comes from America? All of it. Right. Because there it's forbidden by law. You cannot talk about denial of Holocaust. You cannot spread it because they will prosecute you. Right. Here you can do what you want. So they, what they do is they're using the Second Amendment. The First Amendment. Uh, First Amendment, I'm sorry. Free speech, you know. So, so all the garbage comes from here. It always has been that way, but most people don't know that. Right. Speaking to the, uh, about the uh, Arabs now here with the BDS and so on, I don't know whether you're familiar with that. So you know what I'm talking about. They using our... First Amendment for their propaganda. I feel First Amendment is okay to a degree. Not when you preach hate or death. That's when I stop. There is such a thing as going too far. The First Amendment was written for people that are normal. But these are abnormal people. Mm -hmm. yeah, of course, you know, as long you can have free speech, That's but as question. long, yeah, how far can you go? Well, the the people by themselves. Right. This cannot be dictated. I don't believe in dictator in dictations. You know, dictators. I mean, but uh, each and every one of us should know. How far we can go? I cannot say, I want to kill you because you're a Jewess. This is already too far. This has nothing to do with free speech. This is absolute hate. Yeah, but, but they do. Mm -hmm. They say it in the colleges, kill the Jews. Right. So they, they are allowed, apparently. They say this in their colleges? Yes. Don't you see the, what is happening? And I don't know. When you, you see, you're not involved as I am in those things. It hurts me. It hurts me very badly mm -hmm. when I hear those things. Mm -hmm. Kill the Jews. Kill this. Mm -hmm. Kill them. They have no right to live. Uh, no. Is that in uh, yes. In UCLA too. This is the ongoing. What I don't like at all. And I don't know how to, I'm only, I'm an old man yeah. with one voice. Yeah. You understand? But I know stand with us. Do you know that the organization, organization stand with us? They're doing wonders. Okay. They're beautiful. They do something and they're spreading all over the world, which I'm very happy to see. Okay. Yeah. How, you know, I didn't think that I'm going to live to that day yeah. when I'm going to have to face it again. That, that bothers me the most. And uh, and as far as I'm concerned, I don't know what to do. I cannot do much. Uh, I'm a blind old man. What can one do?
Mm-hmm. <coughs> yeah, I believe you. I believe you. I believe you. But we let it happen. We let everything happen because of the First Amendment. I mean, the First Amendment was written for nice, for, for lovely people, <laughs> not for bastards. I'm sorry. Mm, that's a tricky one. I know that. It's very, very it's tricky. tricky because you get into the. I, I agree that I think, you know, UK has the hate speech laws, but then you get into prosecuting people if they even perceive that you hurt their feelings. They're going too far, you right. know. So that, that's that's exactly what it is with every, every ism. Right. Every law has got the same problems because you, because people take advantage of you know, that's why we have lawyers who argue those things, you right. know. And, and I, I don't agree with them, but they, they argue. Right. And I see kind of, you know, that they, they do a lot of policing of speech and they do Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, to their advantage. To their advantage. To the, as long as you abide by the laws of the Red Book, you're fine. If you start deviating, forget it. You are this is every every dictator does the same thing. Mm-hmm. We have seen this. The, the Russians weren't any different. Mm-hmm. As long as you abide it by them, by their laws, you are fine. But if you deviate it a little bit, you are a traitor. So. Yeah. Well, I, I, I you can talk to me for years. Okay, that's all right. <clears throat> I well, think I don't know whether you have enough there. I have enough, and um, we can always do it again. So yeah. I'm so grateful for having you. All right, thank, thank you. you. It's a pleasure. Thank you. And I want to thank uh, Brent for it. Thank you, Brent. It's time for the weekly check-in with Bridget and cousin Maggie. <sighs> <laughs> How you doing, Bridget? <laughs> oh, How do you think, Maggie? Look around. So over there, sulking in the corner. <laughs> I should take a picture. It's probably the first time she's been near you all day because you've been surrounded. I came, walked in and Bridget's sitting on the floor of the study room, basically, and it just surrounded by crap. You, you appear to be in the middle of a sort and organize. I just don't have time for anything. Yeah, I'm trying to get organized as usual, which just feels like my life's miss it, mission that I'm failing at. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that's how we all are, except for maybe Tony Robbins. Fuck Tony Robbins. <laughs> he has people doing all that shit for him. I know. Do you know that he has every suit number? Yes, you told me this on the podcast once. I was like, what? It's the thing that I read that really sticks out the most to me. Like, I just want to get to that level of organization <laughs> where you're like, I need um number 236 <laughs> and make sure to pack 275. It's going to be warm there. <laughs> and the beige 278 goes well in my private island. Yep. Well, this room is a disaster. Yep. That's okay. It's always, it's always... Cl- clutteriest before the clear. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yes. Something I believe Gandhi said once. <laughs> it's just so... I can't keep up. I feel like I'm drowning in tasks and to-do lists and it's taxes too, so I'll feel better when I'm... And then, of course, I go to the doctor and they're like, oh, you need a mammogram. I'm like, oh, great. Oh, boy. So I had to schedule that. It's like always something. Yeah. It's just always, even when you think you're getting ahead, you're... Clear. Yep. No, it's always... There's another problem in the mail. That's life. It's a little thing we like to call life. But, you know, it's not... On the heels of a podcast like this one, it's always so good for me to reflect on just how, like, these are good problems. Yeah. It just means I have too much stuff and I'm busy. Uh huh. <laughs> you know, I'm and not. And you're riding a wave of success, apparently. And honestly, every, you know, when, when I'm not sure if this makes it, made it into the podcast or not, but he does talk about how there's every, the only existential crisis is survival. Uh So even though this feels overwhelming because it's just 
busy work that I absolutely hate. Uh-huh. <laughs> I'm I'm not fighting to survive. I everything's fine. Right. You're not scra- scavenging for food. No, and, yeah. everything's good. It's all good. It's just over. I just feel overwhelmed, but it's all it's all good. And I just have to sit down and do it. And once I actually, that's the weird thing about doing this stuff is that it feels good to do. Yeah. You're like, oh, I know where everything is and it's perfectly organized and my life is clean and clear. And I and mostly I hate clutter. It drives me insane. Uh-huh. And slowly I get more and more crazy the more cluttered my life gets. Uh-huh. And it's like I just feel like it represents the clutter in my brain. Yep. And then I get overwhelmed with like so much it's just stupid. I just have to sit down and do it. But it's I the just, process that sucks. But once even it's the done, process, I don't mind because it's kind of fun and you see all these things that you forgot you had and yeah, little notes you kept and whatever. Uh-huh. And it's actually a good time to do it. It's a good time of the year because I think that this is always when people kind of hit that beginning of the year wall after they come out of the gate. This is when people like stop going to the gym. Uh-huh. It's when they, you know. Even at my gym, this is when you get a two hundred and fifty dollar referral instead of a hundred and fifty dollar referral in January because everyone signs up in January. You get a two hundred and fifty dollar referral. Yeah. Okay. Instead of one fifty. Okay. Which is normally what it is in January, and uh, so I always tell people when they're going to sign up to wait one month so I can get the bigger referral fee and split it with them. Nice. I mean, yeah, it's funny because I so did not, I was telling my friends the other night, I was like, I feel like I did not come out of the gate strong this year. And I'm, I've been like lurching and like (laughs) stutter stepping my way along. I'm like, any forward progress is good progress in my mind. I'm like, I'm just trying to get up to a normal speed, but it's just been such a grind, like stuttering. That's the best way I can describe it. I just have high expectations of myself and know what I, I'd like to be on my vision board. There's that girl in the private jet Uh and she's looking out of her private jet and all of her things are organized and she has nice clothes and doesn't look like a ragamuffin and her eyebrows are done in advance. So she doesn't have to go to events like I did last night with a mustache. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Heaven forbid. <laughs> was it commented on your no, mustache? But of course still, not. I knew it was there. <laughs> it's a, it's enough for the creeping insecurity. Oh, that's funny. And she is a boss bitch, but she looks like she's like ten years younger than me already. No, she doesn't. And she's got she's got it together, folks. We do. We should share your vision board with the the we'll share, community. We'll share it with the patrons. Yeah, the patrons, the supporters, and the support, and the locals, the members. Share it with the locals because uh, it's pretty epic. Your vision board, I love it. I need to do a new one. Yeah, I would. I need to do one too. They're really fun. Yeah, I had so many dreams about Brad Pitt last night. <laughs> I dreamt about him all night. Wow. And I, <laughs> in the dream, he became like a part of our inner circle. <laughs> and there was this awkward moment where they had to like let him know that we wrote this bitch, <laughs> Alina, and made this, <laughs> made this hat. <laughs> and the dream ended with him wearing the hat. <laughs> That's an amazing dream. It was long. It was like the whole <laughs> night was me dreaming about Brad Pitt. And we had to be like, oh, uh, but we were kind of leaking it to him because then we realized it made it seem like we were, if we told that. We were like psycho stalkers. Yes. <laughs> so you're like, oh, we made this um really funny South Park. And then seeing it through the eyes of Brad Pitt, I was like, this isn't very funny. No, I've thought about that before. I'm like, it's, um, but that's true of all South Parks. If you're the target, then. But he, we were kind of right. Yeah, we absolutely nailed it. And then we had to tell him about the Make Brad Pitt Again video, which he was very embarrassed of <laughs> on our behalf because oh, the quality God. was so poor. Yeah, the quality is really poor on that. We were rushed. If we had to do it all again, but it's a learning but curve. 
Honestly, it was a step up from the South Park. It's an. Uh, it's just an. Uh, that's a great dream. I've yeah. Great dream. And then we had to tell him about the make Brad Pitt great again ad. So it was like a series of things. Yep, a series of and confessions. Was, yeah, it was hilarious. Hilarious. Seems there was like more he, to it too, and I don't remember. Seems like he took it all in stride. If he was still hanging out with us at the end of it. With his Brad Pitt, <laughs> make Brad Pitt great again hat on. Hell yeah. That's like one of our life's goals is to get that, ha- have take a picture of Brad Pitt wearing that I'm hat. not sure if it would be better on him or on Jennifer Aniston. Yeah, we always thought that. I feel like it'd be pretty epic on Jennifer. It wa- It would be. It would have been it when he was really at his low point. <laughs> you know, if we could have gotten that like picture when they were going out their there divorce. when it, he was really scraggly and w- the t- point where it caused us to make the hat. Well, the reason that I mentioned Brad Pitt is because he's on my vision board. <laughs> yes, which we've <laughs> talked about before. Ah, uh, yes. So, yeah, we got to share it. It's pretty awesome. But yeah, that girl, the girl on the vision board, she's organized. And she's got the word power right above her. She's not sitting around surrounded by papers and books and things that she doesn't even know in Christmas pants with holes in them, <laughs> no bra, <laughs> and a Pioneer Town shirt from Joshua Tree. <laughs> <laughs> This accurately summarizes what Bridget is wearing. <laughs> Just a ragamuffin. Yep. I'm going to start writing the chronicles of a perpetual ragamuffin and find that picture of me looking like a disaster when I was in kindergarten. You know how to pull it together when necessary, though. Ugh. You do it once a week for dumpster fire, at least. That's as much as I pull it together. Yeah, and it's always like, it's the same as last week where I was cutting holes in the dress to remove the padding. And it's just like, okay, that's the stuff you don't see. (laughs) Yeah, I'm a ragamuffin, all right? I need to purge my whole closet. But yeah, everything's good. I have no complaint. I just, this is the time of year around tax time where I just, I actually, this is the most organized I've ever been going into my taxes. Mm -hmm. Normally, I sit down with them and he's like, all right, well, what's all the expenses? I'm like, can we do this right here while while I'm sitting here? And Uh he's like, I hate you. Um, So this is actually, we're pretty organized, but I'm I'm not quite, my life feels very. Yeah, we're not quite where we want to be yet. And it's true, though, you've also been doing just all the admin tasks for these one-time setup things, but it's a lot of, like, little bullshitty minutia hoops to jump through. But once they're set up, it's it's like you'll never have to do that again. God, I hope so. Or at least, you, hopefully, the next time it comes around, you'll have an assistant to do it. <laughs> I just keep thinking of Jack Welch. If you don't have problems, you're not doing business. And again, I feel really lucky. I I just feel lucky. I, I feel like... It can all change in a minute, and I'm just lucky to be busy and having all these, having too much stuff yeah. that I need to purge it and have food, yep. so much food that I want to lose weight. Like all these things are such, you know, pr- problems of privilege. Yeah. They're the white people problem. Yeah. Not even white people, they're just privilege problems. Uh huh. But well, mostly white people. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It's all all good. We're busy. Yep. We're well. I'm stuttering along. We're I, I can't even say I'm rolling along. But we're, I hate we're that feeling though. Yeah. We're move. At least it's movement for me. I'm like movement. How is pathetic key. of a grown up am I though? I'm like just do three tasks a day, Bridget, to feel like you're making progress. Like it's pathetic. It's not pathetic. It's, it's pathetic. I don't even have children. <laughs> Somehow you find a way to make it all work. Mm, I think I'm an undisciplined mess. <laughs> well, so am I, but at least we're honest about it. <laughs> that doesn't make it better. <laughs> I mean, my schedule, I it's people who observe it are like, I don't know how you function like this. <laughs> Because basically there's just a loose structure of what needs to get done and then I schedule the day 
the next day. Uh -huh. So I have things that like appointments that are standing appointments and then appointments like it makes it my ability to have like podcasts with whoever's in town whenever. Right. And schedule my Patreon calls and all those things. But it also is like insane for anyone who's used to like a routine schedule. Right. Like every day is a different day. Uh, <laughs> yeah. It's really hard on my dog. Yeah, the little bow. She finally settled down because Bridget cleared a place for her to sit. <laughs> Poor little thing. <laughs> she th probably thinks I'm like moving or leaving the country or uh -huh. something because there's like stuff in my she, living room. Yeah, she gets anxious when all the stuff comes out. All dogs do. And this is like there's stuff in every room. I've managed to like make a disaster in every room. <laughs> <laughs> Sam's going to be stoked when she comes home. Oh, yes. It's like that time I just want to purge everything. Like I want to, it's like the, should I fold my clothes or burn the house down? It's all, <laughs> it's that time of year for sure. That's totally the feeling. I think I was Marie Kondoing this time last year. Oh, God. Just purging my life, which made such a huge difference. Have you maintained it? For the most part. I mean, it's, I'm not as strict about it as like freaking Marie is, but... It, it made a huge difference just in kind of upkeep and maintaining my yeah. apartment. Just I got rid of like a third of my stuff. I told my sister I need to fly her out mm. again. Mm -hmm. I'm like, we need to do round two because we didn't have time to go deep. Deep. We yeah. only did surface. Which made a huge difference. It let us start shooting dumpster fire. It's true. Um, but yeah, another round. Your sister's a genius. A she crazy, really is. insane if you are genius. on the East Coast and need someone to come organize your house, my sister is a savant. Yes. She does it for a living. She does. She's a genius. Hmm. Okay. We didn't reach the apocalypse this time, but I think it's time to wrap up this check. -in. Thank gosh. <laughs> for once. We managed to stay on the, the lighter side. The of apocalypse things. is in my house right now. <laughs> if you saw it, I should take a picture. Yep, I have to start documenting these things for the for the supporters. Yeah, the inside behind the scenes look at my. I don't even. I don't even think I've brushed my hair today. So they're like, "This is where my money's going." <laughs> <laughs> look, I'm a plucky little internet hero. Hey. I am the person that we were talking about this earlier. We p spend no money on either one of these production. It's true. Uh, clearly. But it doesn't cost us very much. There was some money in the setup. But now that we're maintaining them both, it's not like we're pouring thousands of dollars into these every single week mm -hmm. because we wouldn't be able to. So when people t whine about how they can't, they're like, I can't do this. I can't do that. I'm like, yes, you can. Yeah. All you need is like, some um you don't need much to get going and then it doesn't take much to keep it going yeah you just got to be willing to sacrifice the time yeah it's the time i mean granted none of us i thought last i i started this week again thinking that monday was friday oh, so that's the worst because i had two shows and then i had a show on monday night and mm -hmm. saturday night and we worked all weekend and then we worked Sunday night on the edit and so I wake up and think it's Friday uh -huh. <laughs> maybe you should try and take like Tuesdays off That'd Tuesdays be a... I can't uh. maybe maybe Wednesday is the closest thing I have to like a day where there's not really anything that is you know but I still can't t there's no such thing as like taking it off yeah I know I know I mean I had four or five emails I had to deal with today just for the like keeping you know locals keeping going, things and, going yeah. yeah keeping plates spinning i'm a small business owner now maggie i know i'm gonna have to start behaving like one <sighs> you have been not really <laughs> <laughs> small business owners brush it's their weird hair. going <laughs> it's weird going from um starving artists to small business <laughs> owner <laughs> Like that yes. should be a book that I write. Starving artist slash waitress to small business owner. Yeah, because you can, I, there are parts of, you know, I'm absolutely grateful for everything. This is what I wanted. This is, but it is the Chinese curse of like, be careful what you wish for. Uh -huh. Because when you're a starving artist slash waitress, you just show up. 
uh-huh. and then do your art whenever you want, and then the end. Yep. And now it's like, I mean, people warn me about this who are in that who are artists who get paid. Yep. Like, be careful when your muse becomes a mule. Yep. And then you have to beat that mule into submission. Uh huh. So, I'm grateful. It's just like it's definitely putting on a different cap than I'm used to wearing. Yeah. A different kind of hat. Uh huh. Not my most favorite hat. No. <laughs> but you're doing it. Getting it done. Ugh. <laughs> We'd like to thank our sponsors, Calm and Beta Brand. Calm is the number one app for sleep, relaxation, and meditation. For listeners of the show, Calm is offering a special limited time promotion of 40% off a Calm premium subscription at calm.com slash walkin. That's C-A-L-M dot C-O-M slash walkin. Getting ready for work and deciding if today is a stylish day or a comfortable day. Now, thanks to Beta Brand's dress pant yoga pants, you don't have to decide. Right now, our listeners can get 20% off their first order when you go to betabrand.com slash walk in. Tune in next week for another riveting episode that will change your life, help you get out of your own way, and solve all the world's problems. I want to thank Ricochet, our composer Jared Elias, my co-producer and cousin Maggie, and all of you out there listening. This has been Walk-In's Welcome with Bridget Fettesy. I'm Bridget Fettesy, and you're welcome. (laughs) (laughs) It's the dumbest line. (laughs)